Our experienced panelists will discuss the lessons learned and best practices from initial planning through to implementation and ongoing enhancements. I'm happy to have three very skilled and experienced panelists. First, Lynette Acosta. Lynette is the Vice President of Professional Services with Woodwing, where she works with publishers and brands to orchestrate their storytelling and improve their speed to market, workflow efficiency, and publishing to different channels. Lynette, any, any additional uh, things you wanted to add there? No, that's it. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Great. We also have James Wonky. James Wonky is an implementation consultant at Widen Enterprises, working with a variety of clients across many facets of the dam implementation journey. James, any comments uh, on your introduction? No, thanks for having me. Excited for the discussion, John. Great. Finally, we have Michelle Crook. Michelle is a director of implementation at Brandfolder, where she leads a team of talented PMs who work hard to help enterprise clients make their damn dreams come true. Michelle, if you want to just say hi. Hello, everyone. Great. So we've broken down this topic uh, into multiple facets, being planning, implementation, and ongoing enhancements. We have a wide variety of questions that we're going to be asking the panelists. Um, and, but please be free uh, to make sure to actually submit your questions. I do have that up on another monitor and I'll try to monitor those and kind of build those in as we go. So on the planning side, uh, first, uh, we will start first with Lynette uh, and we'll go through on this first one with, uh, across everyone. Tell us a little bit about how your organization is helping other clients start their jam, damn journeys. And really what I'm specifically looking for is what are the key use cases and pain points that they're trying to address and maybe the types of assets and content that they are typically handling? So Lynette, um, we'll start yeah, with so, you. Yep. Um, so we work with the, um, with some of the world's le leading publishers and brands and, um, and it's really what we look to do is orchestrate their content creation, management and distribution. And so what we see is that content is a critical differentiator for them and, um, but it's really frequently disorganized. It can be stored in multiple locations. Maybe they have a multiple array of stakeholders that are internal or external to the organization. Um, we call this the, um, the content spaghetti problem, right? Where you have content everywhere. It's just a big, a big mess. Um, and, and it causes them um, lost time to market, you know, frequently lost revenue. Um, it's difficult to find the assets. So we're, and, and, and in terms of the types of, of assets that we're working with is, you know, everything from images, um, video, um, all kinds of files, right? And, um, and and so that's really the problem that we're trying to solve is how do you take that content spaghetti and turn it into um, a beautiful orchestrated um, storytelling? Awesome. James, how about, how about your background in this area? Yeah, I like what Lynette said uh, with the content spaghetti. Uh, we find a lot of those same same use cases, uh, but you know, really focusing around establishing a centralized repository that is going to serve as a single source of truth for assets moving forward. And those assets can range from anything from, from brand assets uh, to work in progress assets to those final assets that are then ready for your, uh, various distribution channels. So serving as a single hub or source of truth for integrations. Um, and and the, the type of assets uh, can be across the board, as Lynette mentioned as well, photos, videos, logos, uh, lots of brand files, maybe even things like documents and GIFs can all be included depending on, on the specific use case. Awesome. And finally, Michelle. I mean, they took all the dead answers. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so really, if people come to us, no one can find the assets um, that they're looking for. It's out of version. So there's like this loss around the like, life cycle control. There's a lack of brand consistency. There's no guardrails on who's sharing what to whom. Um, so there's a lot of wasted time and energy for especially the creative team trying to manage all of those pain points. So, you know, we're really looking to address each one of those and build a system that's gonna allow them, you know, an easy way to manage this from a day-to-day -day perspective while allowing all their end users to self-serve the types of things that they need when they need them. Um, and that collateral really goes across creatives, marketing, e-com, PR, web, Advertising, it's also a great way to manage relationships with, you know, agencies, third parties, et cetera. So basically anything they create, we manage. Awesome. And Michelle, let's stick with you so that we'll give you an opportunity to give the good answer. Uh, how can a company <laughs> that's just beginning their damn journey get started on building their damn justification, business case, and roadmap? So yeah. really focus on kind of key benefits to damn, where are the biggest cost savings, things of that nature. 
Yeah. So some of the key benefits, um, so one is like analytics, right? Because essentially you have all this creative content, but without being able to see where it's used, how it's performing, you're just kind of creating beautiful things and hoping for the best. So having something that allows you to do like data driven decision making, um, that's going to lead to higher performing campaigns, better brand consistency. It also helps you uh, maintain compliance with like digital rights and security so that your legal teams can sleep better at night. Um, and then just, you know, increasing automation across the life cycle of content. So like wherever that kind of point is, having automation helps with consistency and compliance and ultimately leads to happier creatives, which I think everybody wins from. Um, but I would say like with the roadmap for that, a lot of what we're looking at is like who, what are the, the highest priority assets? What are the highest priority audiences? And kind of building those like initial steps into DAM around that. Um, I find that that produces the, the quickest road to ROI. Um, and it also just helps you grow into bigger use cases because you're going to learn a lot from that. Um, you're going to be a, a better damn admin by the time you're kind of growing into those other use cases. Um, but, but ultimately, it's just kind of identifying what those initial assets, audiences, and I guess like integrations are as well to start with. That's great. And any, any uh, other responses from James or, or Lynette in that particular question in terms of damn justification? Okay. Yeah, the, um, the one thing that I would add to that is that when you're beginning your journey, right, and, and you're maybe even thinking about this, the most important thing to do is to identify what's, what's your goal internally and what is the problem you are trying to solve and why, right? Um, so I say re reusability, searchability, integrations, content distribution, right? Um, and then you can assign a value to that problem. Um, so in, in terms of how much time is it going to save you um, are you going to um, syndicate and monetize your content, right? Um, so, um, so this helps you, number one, identify the features that you're looking for in a DAM when you're selecting a vendor, right? And then, but also help, it helps you build a business case um, and quantify um, the benefits, right, that, um, that you're going to achieve. So um, I know a lot of people are trying to sell the idea internally to their organizations and coming equipped with this information. It's, it's really useful. Yeah, agreed. I would, I would say it all starts with the strategy is what we really focus on mm -hmm. right up front is what is your strategy and what, how are you defining success? How are we going to know when the dam was successful and, and what does that look like mm -hmm. for you? So we like to focus on uh, assets, audience and advantages and what are all those and, and lay those out before we even get started. Yeah. And I will say just also from experience, we've seen that many of our successful, successful clients that have had success in the long run also continue to do cost avoidance kind of benefit uh, modeling throughout the years, uh, even in the, the post years of go live and doing that. So they're constantly justifying that because dam in some cases can become a cost center. So it's important to let them know what the benefits are long-term as you start knocking down use cases and everything that goes yep. with that. Um, James, there's a lot of tools and solutions out there. Uh, and we typically recommend doing a detailed solution evaluation to make sure the selected dam solution fits an organization's current and future state needs. Can you discuss some of the key considerations uh, that the audience should think about and keeping in mind for when they're actually doing a dam solution evaluation? What are some of the, the biggest differentiators that, uh, that, you, that you're coming across today and where folks are making that selection of a, uh, of a tool? Yeah, there's, I could go on for days about this one, John, but uh, to start with, I think it's really a lot of, you know, a lot of the focus is going to be around the tool and the features and the functionality of it. But I think really what you should be looking for is a true partner who is going to be, who aligns with you culturally, who's going to be your, your partner moving forward and be there when you need them um, and, and be able to support you in the ways, not only from the beginning, but throughout your entire life cycle. Um, so I think start there, make sure that, that it identifies with you and, and that who you're going to partner with is an extension of your team and of your company, uh, and then start getting into more of the the feature set of of you know the ease of use and the and the flexibility of the system. Um, you could build a great dam, but if it's not easy to use or or your users can't figure out how to best use it, uh, it's all for naught. So uh, finding something that's going to be easy, that's going to be able to scale with your business. Um, and then I would also just stress someone who's got a history in the space, who's, who's done this many times before, and one who uh, has, has a proven track record of, of working with you know, brands uh, of, of similar size and similar um, reach a, a, as to yourself. Great. Uh, any additional feedback from Lynette or Michelle? 
No, I mean, I, I think, yeah, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was like, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think, um, you know, when I was kind of prepping for this, I was thinking about like, you know, I was thinking ease, scalability, flexibility, um, and that flexibility and ease of use is just so key because if we think about like the times that we're in right now, I mean, when COVID hit, people were probably in the middle of campaigns and projects and pushing forward with that and then having to quickly pivot. You should have a dam that can support that, that, that doesn't create a whole new set of problems for you. It's like, this is what you're working on today. This is what you're working on tomorrow. And there's no disruption in that because of how your dam operates. Right. Um, Lynette, question from the audience. Uh, they mentioned that uh, you mentioned getting buy-in from stakeholders. How do you reconcile when they conflict? Uh, better to gather separately or collaboratively? Um, so, so I'm I'm really big on collaboration, right? And and sometimes that can lead to difficult conversations, right? But um, uh, I I think part of how you manage change in an organization is by bringing people together and 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 helping everybody understand the big picture, right? And why sometimes some priorities are um, maybe more pressing, right? Or, or it, it's not that anybody's request is more important than the other necessarily, right? But um, which one aligns better with the organization? So, so that, that's definitely an, an some, you know, I, something we do even when we are starting a dam implementation with our clients. And, and I really love that idea of partnering, right? We, we almost become an extension of our customer's organization. And, and the first thing we do is we tell everybody um, how how this is um, it's it's an exciting time in the organization right where they can actually help drive and and own the change right and so when you have that sense of ownership and when people understand the the reasons behind why some decisions are being made I think um, even if you end up on the losing side of of a you know priority argument you understand why and and you can get on board. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let's go back to, uh, let's actually, let's stick with Lynette. Um, when, when planning for a dam implementation, what are some of the key requirements that you've seen as challenges in the past and that should have more thought and, and be planned around? Yeah, so, so you, you frequently see that people wanna jump straight into the technology, right? And, and, um, and they approach this as a technical problem. And, and um, so, so something that we really emphasize is that you really need to think about your workflow and your metadata requirements up front, right? So, so there's this really big strategic planning um, that needs to happen. Um, and then also use your DAM implementation as a way to rethink how you do everything, right? Um, and, and don't just take your current same old way of working and, and digitize that, right? Um, so, so it's a, it's, it's always good to continuously be thinking about how do you become more efficient going forward, right? Um, and then the other thing, and we touched a little bit on it, is um, think also upfront about how you're going to drive adoption, um, um, you know, with, with your user base and them, um, and what's your overall organization um, management and change management strategy, right? I think those tend to be the bigger challenges and not so much necessarily the technology. Great. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, let's go to James. James, rather than boiling the ocean and doing a big bang approach, we typically build a phase roadmap so that it can be demonstrated quick wins along the way to get buy-in across our organization. What are some initial dam use cases and user groups that you typically see companies starting with? Yeah, so we, we often uh, do see a phased approach and uh, all of that uh, we like to outline ahead of time in the strategy. So we know when we start, we are focused on phase one, what is incorporated in phase one, who are audiences, who are the assets, and what is the goal of, of that phase. So oftentimes we see it's a marketing or creative uh, team that is, is maybe the first group that's in there, or maybe if you've got a larger team, it's just a smaller subset of, of those, um, maybe from various backgrounds that are going to be more of your test group. and. Uh, and really the ultimate goal initially being the searchability, the findability, the metadata tagging, and the availability of those assets. Uh, so that's step number one. And then, you know, further phases often include things like those integrations, um, but really nailing the, the upload, the storage of those assets, findability, and then your distribution methods downstream uh, would be kind of the core use cases. Great. Anything to add from Lynette or Michelle on that particular question? No, I, I um, so so we look at we look at the um, dam journey as um, 
there's three components of it, right? There's the creation, the management, and the distribution. Um, and and um, so I, I would agree that people usually start with that management of assets as the initial um, case study, and then they move on to workflows around content creation and distribution. We see, we see this. Yeah. yeah, I would agree mm -hmm. with that. We, we usually see folks mm -hmm. start with finalized content and then work upstream to the work in progress and then downstream on the distribution yep. side. So now we're going to get more into the implementation aspect of this. And, and I know that there's a lot of questions out there and we'll actually, we're going to start with a, a couple uh, big ones just from the audience and then we'll get into some of our, our prepped questions. Uh, the first one comes from David Boyd. Uh, any particular pitfalls to watch for when implementing at an advertising slash marketing agency with multiple clients and brands versus in-house at a brand? And so, so Michelle, Lynette, James, does so anyone want to jump on that one? I think I, one thing. <laughs> um, I think one to, thing to consider. Um, we we come up against this a lot with when we're kind of strategizing around what the structure of the dam is going to be. So you know, permissioning is definitely key, but it should be done in a way that's again, it goes back to making it easy to manage from like a day to day perspective. Um, I think sometimes people have a hard time seeing the forest through the trees. So they're like, we have a, a million different people that we have to distribute to. We have a million different kinds of assets and it's, it's hard to kind of separate those out. But if you have a platform that really provides good um, permissioning and access, then that can simplify that process very quickly. And I guess some of the points that do you guys typically, are they, do you have them all in one metadata model, separate metadata models? Cause you're, you're, you're basically potentially having different brands and, and, uh, you know, clients that could be on the kind of that one platform. Do you see, like, what are some of the challenges there? Just in general, not even with your, your platform. I, th I think in general, it's, oh, sorry, Lynette, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead. I was going to say in general, it's, it's aligning uh, around a, a common terminology and vocabulary. I think those are a lot of the challenges where, you know, different organizations, especially if it's many out, uh, outside partners are, are leveraging different vocabulary, different terms for certain things. So I think that alignment around uh, how the metadata structure is being used, you know, for simplicity and for consistency, we would recommend that that's probably the same across all the partners. Um, but in certain cases, it, it does make sense to break that up and, and try and tie it together in another way. Right. And we're going to go to another question that was, uh, that was asked, and this was asked earlier uh, in, in basically the, the conversation here. Um, and maybe we could have uh, Michelle lead off with this. In your experience, is role specific or function specific training the way to go when launching a dam? Or can businesses get away with generic training across teams? How do you best juggle team specific training without overextending your launch resources? Oh, I love that, that's a great question. Um, so I think it, it honestly depends a lot on each client's situation. I would say I'm kind of a fan of more role-based training um, because, you know, when you're talking to somebody who's just a consumer of the assets, if you're doing the training, then really you're looking at how do they navigate, how do they search, what, they, what can they do once they find what they're looking for, right? When you're talking to somebody who's more of um, a collaborator or has editable access, you want to be able to focus on, you know, not only can you consume from this stand, but when you add, these are the things that you have to be aware of. This is the taxonomy that you need to stay in line with. Um, but I would say, you know, just from like a resource standpoint, we have a lot of global clients where um, we do end up kind of training their, you know, their guest users or their consumers with their collaborators in a region specific kind of way, because even though they have a group that might be uploading and managing content, they're still, this is still their first exposure to the tool and they can help each other within that region with questions and feedback back to whoever is ultimately managing the dam. Um, so I, I think that, you know, one of the things to consider is just how intense is that workflow for the people that are uploading and contributing and what are your resources like across, you know, kind of your global landscape. Awesome. Um, this next question uh, I'll ask to all of you. So you, you've all been in this space for a long time and know the fundamentals from DAM, from ingest, metadata tagging, search, UX, distribution, workflow automation, everything that goes in that. Where do you see companies struggle or fail on their dam implementations? How do you get them over that hurdle? So James, let's start, start with you. Where are some of the kind of the big struggling factors on kind of these implementations that you've seen? 
Yeah, I would say the the two biggest ones that come to mind are change management, uh, just the overall change process. So many times we're so focused on the configurations and the features that we forget about communication and the importance that change management plays in the entire process. Uh, so that would be number one. And then I think number two that comes to mind for me is just assembling the right project team, having the right level of authority, the right level of, of access to additional resources at the organization and, and the and uh, folks that can dedicate the appropriate amount of time uh, to make this system and get it set up in the proper way. Great. Uh, Lynette? Yeah, yeah my, my answer is very similar. Uh, what we see is that it's really all around change management process and managing scope, right? Not, not trying to do too much all at once. Um, so start small and grow, but yeah, um, it's a lot of the same challenges that, that we see. Great. And finally, Michelle. So Do we have what a trifecta I here? <laughs> yeah. um, so what I see a lot of is what I call analysis to paralysis. And I say yeah. that often enough. If I have clients watching this, I guarantee you they're chuckling right now. Um, it's kind of that, that whole saying, um, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So, you know, when it comes to ingestion, metadata, user audiences, all those things, like that can feel so overwhelming to begin with. So just having a good partner that's going to help you untangle that put that in a timeline, help you execute on each of those steps while maintaining that big vision, then any of the other things like ingestion or metadata, that's more of a technical issue that a tech, like an expert can help you with. Yeah, and, and I know that I'm not supposed to weigh in as the moderator, but a moderator, but I will say that the process re-engineering and the change management is huge uh, and it is so often overlooked and it's the first thing that gets cut from the budgets. So if you do take, have mm -hmm. one takeaway from here, it's extremely important. Do not let them take that out of your budget. That is a, a, a very uh, a strong thing there. So thanks everyone for that. We do have a very interesting question here. Lynette, they wanna know who's actually on your chair in the background there. <laughs> um, is, who, um, oh, is, is it Andy Warhol, that little guy back there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of questions flying around. <laughs> they're, they're, they're my my mother-in-law bought that for the kids and um, people think he's Einstein because of the hair, but yeah, it's Andy Warhol. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next question on the implementation side. Uh, and Lynette, maybe we start with you. What, what makes asset migrations or system integration so difficult? Uh, whew, yeah, this is my favorite subject. Um, so so um, I think maybe you need to look at them differently, right? Because asset migration and integrations are so um, different. And so uh, we're currently working with a, um, I'll say an, an iconic sports magazine to migrate over 60 years of their um, photo archive to the cloud. Um, it's over 25 million assets, 200 terabytes of data, right? So um, think about just the scale of, of what you're trying to do and, and all of that in a tight deadline, right? Um, so, so there, so you run into technical challenges. Um, you, you know, you run into people, you know, being worried about are they going to have what they need. Um, so, so what we, what we've done is um, we really emphasize prioritizing. What are your most important files, right? What, what do you need on day one? And and um, and frequently you find that you don't need the full 200 terabytes of data on day one, right? Um, the other thing that's really important is to organize your assets as much as possible before migrating, right? If, if, you, if you load a bunch of junk, that's what you're gonna have there, right? Um, and then also find ways to tag and add metadata to those assets um, at, at import, right? Because it's really, really difficult to go back after the fact and, and apply metadata. So that's where AI tools come, come in really handy, right? And, and um, automation and, and things like that. And then, and then also um, manage expectations, right? So you can maybe run base, for, for massive archives like that, you can run baseline tests on how long it, it's gonna take and, and then help manage expectations and plan around that. So, you know, if you need to upscale or, or whatnot. So, so those are some of the challenges that we've seen on, on the migration side. And then on the, on the integration side, it's really all about um, reinventing the wheel every time, right? Um, it's very difficult frequently for end users upfront to really know what it is that they want, right? And, and, um, and, and to really kind of give you clear specs of what they're trying to achieve. So, so I think that the recommendation there is to be agile, right? And, and, and to um, think about what are the minimum um, increments of value that you can be delivering, right? Um, 
I like how Michelle said, take, take the elephant and eat it one bite at a time, right? Um, and and um, I think you frequently see integrations and automation projects in general fail because um, people are trying to do too much at once, right? So I think th those are some of the um, challenges we've found and how we've tackled them. Awesome. A any other kind of additions to that from Michelle or, or James on that particular question? Yeah, I think Lynette hit on some great points. I would just add that there's a lot of, uh, as much as all the, the, a lot of the dam systems are, are similar, they're all very different in terms of how they ingest content, how their content is stored, and what the organizational structure looks like. So some cleansing or some organization ahead of the import into the new system often takes more time than originally anticipated. But yeah, doing as much at scale as possible uh, is, is absolutely critical to, to being able to handle, especially a, a migration such as the size you're talking about, Lynette. Right. Michelle, metadata. Oh, we love metadata, right? <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a love-hate term for many people. So without good metadata, it makes finding assets almost impossible, which is some of the complexity of even the conversion and migration that we were just talking about. Um, what do you see as best practices around metadata in terms of kind of setup, you know, control vocabulary, governance, things of, of that nature? Yeah. Um, well, I would say, I mean, that's, that's again, kind of one of those things that it's difficult people, for people to get started on because, you know, they're, they're trying to capture everything all at once. So I would say start with what you know, you know, just keep it simple, start with what you know. There's generally things that are very obvious to begin with and know that it's going to grow from there. Um, and growing from there comes from a couple of different places. One is, you know, taking surveys of other departments or users in the dam and kind of seeing what are the, what's the terminology, what's the language that's important to them, how will they be searching? Because I see a lot of times like one group will, they, they live and die by campaigns and another one does it by projects and there's some crossover in there, right? So is that something that you need to account for? Um, another thing is just taxonomy maturing over time, right? So I know something that's really helpful that we have is the ability to not just see what's being used, but what's being searched and what are the results that are returning based on user searches. And that can be used to really help fine tune and keep your taxonomy just clean over time. Um, the other thing with that is um, one of the sessions I caught yesterday, please, I hope I don't butcher this name, but Jay Hordeski um, was talking about metadata. And he was talking about how language is always evolving, right? And that affects metadata because if you have say an acronym that means one thing today, but because of current events, maybe means another thing tomorrow. Um, you need to be able to pivot on that. And you should, A, like have some sort of governance, some sort of system in place where you know that you're looking at those things consistently. But when you identify what needs to change, you should have a quick, easy way to do that. Great answer. James, Lynette, anything else to add there? I, I would just I would add... Yeah, I was just going to add, I think it's just clearly establishing who is responsible for populating the metadata and how that's going to get in there is, is a key component that's often overlooked. You can develop the, the best hierarchy out there, but if, if it's not clear who is responsible for that information or where that's coming from, uh, it's, it's worthless. That's a great awesome. point. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so James, let's, let's start with you. Uh, there can be such a focus on technology. Uh, at these conferences, but change management and process transformation are just as important as the successful uh, to a successful dam platform. Can you discuss a little bit about the change management journey and things that have worked uh, on your different clients? So really, what, what are some of the steps? And I know that we mentioned that that's a success factor, but what are some of the things that you do on the change management side to ensure success? Yeah. So change management, you got to start early. Uh, so as early as possible, you can start getting uh, the awareness built of, of your user bases that change is coming, what it's uh, all going to encompass, and, and how they can best prepare. So giving them the tools they need to prepare for the change as much as possible. I think another thing that we find very helpful is building a coalition of advocates or, or evangelists that can really be your, uh, your, your folks out in the field that are spreading the good news about what change is coming. Um, and as, as much as they can talk it up as possible and get ahead of it, that's really gonna, gonna be beneficial uh, throughout the entire process. So I think first and foremost, it's you know, establishing a plan, starting early, and then running that change management plan all the way through reinforcement. 
uh, really change management should never stop and it should continually be a feedback loop and reinforcement of, of the initial change uh, because as we've all talked about here, you're gonna have to be agile and things are going to change over time as you scale and as, as your use cases maybe shift a little bit, uh, you're gonna have to continually manage those changes uh, throughout a variety of different audiences and a variety of different uh, user bases. Awesome. Lynette, Michelle, anything to add to, to that? I know we've been talking about that quite a bit. <laughs> one thing I would maybe add to that, and this is maybe a little bit of a different take on the question, um, but I would say like one size does not fit all. We work with like, you know, we're obviously industry agnostic being in DAM. And so a client that I have that exports chemicals, you know, globally is going to have probably different internal processes than a client I have that makes delicious beer. Um, so one is just kind of identifying like, where is your client at? What's, again, what is going to be the user adoption on the change management that you help them create and kind of understanding their starting point and their needs from there. Awesome. So let, let's take a, a few questions from the audience and before we go into our next uh, section. Um, so we have one around automation. Best advice for deciding on what to automate at dam launch versus what to prioritize later. Any, any response to that just in terms of automation? Um, I, so, so that has a lot to do. Remember how, how I said that before you even start your DAM program, you want to think about what your goals are, right? And what is the problem you're trying to solve? And that really should inform those decisions, right? Um, so for somebody, they, they might want to add a lot of automation around um, content, you know, upload or, or generation, right? And other people, it's really more around distribution. And, and I, I think there, there necessarily isn't a right answer for any organization, right? Because it's really all about um, what, what your goal is and what you're trying to do. Yeah. That would be my scale and uh, Scale and ROI may factor into mm -hmm. that too, right? In terms of, yep. you know, what is, what is the payback? I, any other responses to that from James or Michelle? I, I would agree with that. I think it's just got to be part of your strategy. You have to define what is your, your MVP for, for that initial launch and if that is incorporated as part of that or if that can be vetted out uh, later on in the process. Okay. So we have a couple change management questions here. Um, who tends to be the biggest converts? Reluctant at first and then champions at the end. Does anybody have any stories about that? Converting them over for the reluctant, I will not do this. I will not change. Uh, and then, and then. So, so we, um, we work a lot with publishers, right? Magazine publishers. And, and um, I always, um, I don't know if you guys have seen um, the movie, The Devil Wears Prada. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of those are our customers, right? And, and sometimes you have um, people that, that are, it's very difficult for them to accept change, right? And they're very, very influential in an, an organization and, and, um, and what they say is respected, right? Um, so, so it takes, you know, it, what we've learned is that if you win those people, if you win those people over initially, right? And, and that's where, um, I think this is where the art of being in, in the services business, right? Comes in, right? It, um, it's how, how do you create that connection with those people so that you, convince them of what's the value um, um, for them, right, individually. And then once you have those people um, on board, it's very, you know, the, the organization follows, right? So, so sometimes they're not even necessarily the most senior person, right? But, it, but it's really um, people that are, you know, very influential in, in organizations in other ways. So um, we do find that um, to be very important. Yeah. Well, and to Lynette's point earlier, like when you're in the beginning and you're strategizing and certain priorities are put over others, um, and sometimes people kind of hold on to that, I think it's also helpful as you go, go along the way that it may not, like their needs may not be priority, but if you can still highlight throughout the process of how this helps them and solves their pain point, that can soften people up. Because I've definitely, when you said that, I thought of a client who's kind of like, he wasn't really participating in onboarding, he was part of the team, he's kind of like, ah, whatever. Um, after like a month after they launched, he's like, I haven't had to field an errant email of somebody asking me for something for like a month. Like, what else can this thing do? And I'm like, absolutely. Let's talk about it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Just getting away of their pain or their busy work. But James, putting you on the spot, question from a user. Uh, and this is from Lewis. 
what do you do when you need to make large scale changes, but your stakeholders are resolute not to allow change and not open to it? <laughs> well, Lewis, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, I would say, I, I would say in that case, you probably need to, to go back and, and maybe relook at the ROI of the change and, and find a different way of framing it up with them. Um, I think if, if you can clearly articulate why you feel like the change is warranted and, and why you feel like it's needed, um, I, I think you know, defining that out in a, in a strategy and in a plan that you can present back maybe in a, a different way than it was presented initially, uh, it, it always speaks volumes. And so having, having just a clear plan and uh, having some hard numbers on there as much as you can get, get around that, uh, I know that that's a challenge a lot of times in the dam space, uh, but, but getting some analytics or getting some numbers to back you up in, in going to the, that uh, executive or, or that contact uh, to advocate for the change. Thank you. So now we'll talk about a bit about ongoing enhancements because that kind of ties into this too. Um, so we often see clients focusing heavily on initial implementation, but then are a little caught off guard when it turns into sustainment and enhancements. What are your thoughts on dam governance and ongoing support structures? Michelle, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, so something that we do is we kind of take that subject and fold it into implementation, right? So as you're putting together the structure and you're talking through the distribution strategies, very much a part of that conversation is like on an ongoing basis, this is what that looks like. So post launch, there's not this like kind of paradigm shift in how an admin is interacting with the platform. You know, the only difference now is there's users in the platform, they're still doing what they were doing kind of all along. And that allows them to kind of speed up when they can focus on phase two and phase three. Any other, any other responses from Lynette or James? Um, we always... So, so uh, <laughs> you go ahead. I was just going to say, we always like to schedule some sort of report to leadership. Hold yourself accountable, keep leadership updated so they can know how the system's performing. And that's going to really pay off and hold you accountable for the metrics and the goals that you've set out for yourself. Got it. Yeah, so the, the other uh, yeah the other thing I would add is that um, think think of them as a as a journey right it's not a thing that you're gonna come and do on day one and then it's done right um, and and then um, so so it should be a journey of continuous improvement and and the more you make that clear to the organization right the more they understand that it might not be perfect on day one and you might not do everything you you want it to do on day one but but it's a process right and 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 it's gonna it's going to continue to grow. So having that govern, governance structure and, and, and a process for people to submit um, and, and know that they're being heard, right, in, in terms of what improvements they want and, and, and that people understand how the decisions are being made, right? And um, so that all really helps um, with, with, you know, continuous ongoing enhancements and improvements. Got it. And a lot of questions around kind of SaaS and kind of the migration of technologies. And it's right in line with one of the questions that we actually have for the panel. So rather than monolithic dam systems, many organizations are moving towards more of a cloud native microservices based architecture to help them remain more future proof. What are the thoughts and experience around this trend? James, let's start with you. Yeah, I think uh, the current pandemic situation has even pushed this to the forefront even more by having those those cloud-based solutions where uh, you can work around some of those technology roadblocks like a VPN or, or like some of those server structures where, where uh, assets used to be stored and really making those available anywhere and everywhere for your user bases, where, wherever they are in the world. So uh, I think that is going to continue to be a, a trend that continues to move forward. Um, and then really just focusing on how can we get the content to the end users even more quickly, whether it's integrations or whether it's using a, a CDN or something like that to even push to the edges even further and more quickly. Okay. And, and are you seeing, are, are all you seeing more of a trend for with the clients trying to stick more to out of the box kind of SaaS solutions uh, as opposed to large platforms with customizations or are you still seeing a, a, a wide variety of combination of that? That's to anybody. We, we see a lot of interest in, in um, maybe starting out with out of the box, but really in integrating, right? Um, yeah. So a lot of integration and automation. Um, and, and because a lot of um, the systems are SaaS, right? It's, it's not just a dam, right? Um, so we definitely see a big trend there, continues to be. 
For sure. And I think things being like cloud native and modular and configurable, I mean, it, it allows for smoother transition across different platforms. It also allows for easier updates. So I know like, you know, when we get like our, our client signals, we respond to those and we iterate on those, being able to release to something that's cloud-based allows us to do that seamlessly without disruption on their end, without any kind of IT resources needed on their end as well. Great. And another question came through here. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So our organization, and, I, and I'm sure you guys are going to have a lot of feedback on this. Our organization is implementing a new DAM system and management has opted not to hire a dedicated asset manager and we have no formal or written governance policies. I'm concerned about the distributed model of management. That buy-in will be low, metadata and asset organization will be poor, and that there will be general confusion. Thoughts or strategies on how to deal with this situation. I have limited structural power within the organization, but care about the future of the system since our team is going to be very dependent on it. So how about Michelle, do you wanna start with that one? <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I think that's one of those things where um, we go back to what's the business case that you're putting together, like whether or not you have you know, a lot of authority or stake, you know, a good stakeholder isn't going to ignore good information. And when you talk about a dam having um, actionable intelligence, being able to prove ROI, build on that, um, utilizing things like automation to take things off people's plates, um, I think that all makes a really good use case for making sure that you've set yourself up to maintain good hygiene on your dam and to be able to, you know, create that, that kind of product that can you know, be enhanced throughout your organization. And you're not gonna have that if you don't have ownership of it, whether that's a dedicated, um, you know, dam manager or dedicated admins that take on that ownership because you have good governance. Um, but I think really speaking to kind of like that actionable analytics, speaking to the ROI and kind of showing, you know, how your dam can help future-proof your organization. Don't take no for an answer. Just yeah, any, any, <laughs> any other responses there? Okay. What one thing just just to add on that too is just even the some of these systems actually can even lock down some of the governance functions, right? Certain amount of required fields, controlled vocabularies, things of that nature that actually don't need to be trained, don't need to have that, but at least it gets some of the required metadata in there and kind of security policies and handling there to restrict them. Um, okay, uh, let's do one more question here. I came uh, in over one year after implementation. After learning our system, I set my sights on teaching my users uploads because in that year, we had next to no assets uploaded. I do not have good user engagement. Was training the right first step here? What are uh, some other suggestions to get them more excited about the system to have things be more uploaded? Anyone? Um, it might be a good idea to go and ask them why, right? Um, why they're not uploading the assets and, and um, it might be that they don't like the UI. Maybe it's configured um, in a way that's too complex, right? Um, there might be ways to get the, you know, the, the same dam you have simplified. Maybe there's too much metadata that's required up front and they don't, and, and it's metadata that's not really used that much. That, that does tend to happen that maybe the, the metadata schema is too complex, right? So whatever the answer is, um, um, I, I think training always helps, right? But really try and understand what the problem is and, and then you can come up with a very specific solution. Awesome. And I know we're getting very close on time. We've been answering all the questions as they've came through. Um, final one, as organizations continue to grow their dams, what will they need to be ready for in the future? Some uh, new trends or things that you guys want to talk about or that you're excited about just in terms of uh, as dam matures even further? I think, I think automation is going to continue to be a big one. Automation and integrations, we hear a lot about it um, and, and lots of desire to do it. I think uh, a lot of times, you know, it, it still needs some more structure around it or some more strategy around it. But I, I, I foresee automations and uh, establishing a full marketing technology stack that can sync with each other and, and speak with each other and eliminate a lot of those manual steps in between is, is definitely where we're headed. Yeah. yeah, I would, I would say, you know, absolutely that also, you know, things like CDN, um, which really allow you to power websites, run your email campaigns, um, and it's just getting more powerful every day. Um, so really being able to utilize that so a dam can fully be your single source of truth and really power all of those things I think is incredible and it's just going to better and better places. Yeah. That any, yeah, you, any final yeah. thoughts? Yeah, um, you see a trend towards faster and faster content, right? Distributed to more and more channels. That 
that's really um, why a lot of the you know people, especially organizations whose content is their competitive di differentiator. Um, so I think from a damn perspective, you see tendencies towards um, breaking content into smaller and smaller um, units, right? They, they call it atomic content, um, where you can then take those bits of content and, and maybe combine it with AI to create a, a truly personalized experience, right, um, for a user. Um, so, so it's really all about how do you monetize your, your content and, and, and deploy it fast and personalize like a lot yep. around that. Yeah, we're seeing a ton of automation and also, Michelle, you even mentioned before, analytics is huge now. So analytics on even how they're using the dam, but even we're starting to see now analytics after the asset gets out into the wild and kind of what, what were the trends on that and coming back and informing the creative process. It seems like the holy grail, but uh, that was basically, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing quite a bit of that. Uh, I believe that we are up, up on time here. So I absolutely want to thank the panelists. This has been a great informative uh, panel and thank you very much. And if anyone has any last questions, and I, I do have I do have one more, just in case they haven't shut shut us off yet. Uh, in recent <laughs> reorg, uh, the dam manager became my direct report. Are there any good books to read, like Dam for Dummies, that you would recommend? Any books? Any sources? Any videos? I know Bram Holder has a lot of ebooks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we could all be self-serving right now. I mean, there's a lot of content out there, especially with Henry Stewart mm -hmm. and things like that. I know that we're even doing uh, a video series, like a masterclass on DAM at on-prem. There's a lot of things that are out there that, uh, that I think you could, could go, but you're in the right community. This is definitely where the experts are. Yeah, right. reach out to the people that you've met, right? Some, some of the speakers that you've seen and yeah, that ask questions, network, yeah. Absolutely. Great. We're all here well, to help. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you. Bye. All. I really appreciate thank your time. You. Bye bye. Bye.